Hello, everyone. It's 7 o'clock. Breaking news this morning on a rescue bid for Silicon Valley Bank. We'll have the latest. Plus, it's been a weekend to forget for the BBC as the Gary Lineker row led to a presenter mutiny, a massive hole in the broadcaster's sports coverage and a growing backlash over its impartiality rules. But could there be a resolution in sight? On the show this morning, the chief executive of NHS Providers, Labour's Shadow Work and Pension Secretary and the former chief of the general staff, Lord Richard Dannett. It's Monday, the 13th of March. In breaking news, HSBC Bank is on the brink of rescuing the UK arm of the failed lender, Silicon Valley Bank. The BBC and Gary Lineker close in on a deal over an impartiality row after a tumultuous weekend for the broadcaster. Pressure grows on the BBC's chairman as the Prime Minister declines to back him. Richard Sharp was appointed by a government before my time, before I was Prime Minister, through a rigorous process. Now that process is being reviewed again. And a warning of significant disruption to the NHS as tens of thousands of junior doctors begin a three-day walkout. Britain boosts its military spending to counter risks from Russia and China as the Prime Minister heads to the US to seal a new defence deal. Voting begins today in the SNP leadership race as all three candidates prepare for a live showdown on Sky News. And the Oscar goes to everything, everywhere, all at once. And everything, everywhere, all at once cleans up at the Oscars with seven awards. I'll bring you all the glitz and the glamour as the stars gather for the after party on Hollywood's biggest night. Hello, good morning. Let's start with some breaking news. HSBC is on the brink of a deal to rescue the UK arm of Silicon Valley Bank after a large stitch agreement that will avert the technology-focused lender's insolvency. Well, Sky presenter Ian King is here now with the latest. Uh, Ian, this has come very, very much just before the markets open, really. Just tell us a little bit more. Well, you can, Jane. In the last few moments, the Bank of England has put out a statement confirming that HSBC UK has indeed bought uh, Silicon Valley Bank's UK business. I can read you the statement. It says the Bank of England, in consultation with the Prudential Regulation Authority, HM Treasury and the Financial Conduct Authority, has taken the decision to sell Silicon Valley Bank UK Limited, the UK subsidiary of the US bank, to HSBC UK Bank. HSBC is authorised and supervised by the PRA and the FCA. This action has been taken to stabilise SVB UK, ensuring the continuity of banking services, minimising disruption to the UK technology sector and supporting confidence in the financial system. The Bank of England says uh, the bank and HM Treasury can confirm that all depositors' money with SVB UK is safe and secure as a result of this transaction. SVB UK's business will continue to be operated normally by SVB UK. All services will continue to operate as normal and customers should should not notice any changes and the bank goes on to say customers can continue to contact SVB UK through the usual channels and borrowers should make any loan repayments to SVB UK as normal. SVB UK staff remain employed by SVB UK and SVB UK continues to be a PRA, FCA authorised bank. And then the final uh, line of this statement from uh, the Bank of England says today's announcement supersedes the bank's 10th of March statement that absent any meaningful further information it intended to apply to the court to place SVB UK into an insolvency procedure. So that is the uh, breaking news in the last couple of moments. Uh, the Bank of England confirming there that Silicon Valley Bank UK has been bought by HSBC UK. All depositors uh, save, uh, deposits are safe and secure. The business will continue continue to trade as normally. That, of course, confirmation of a story that uh, our colleague Mark Lyman broke just a few moments uh, before 7 o'clock there. I think this will uh, reassure a lot of people. S Silicon Valley Bank UK has some 3,300 UK customers all of whom more or less are in the tech and startup sector. There was a lot of concern over the weekend about the ability of those customers to access their cash. There was something like £7 billion worth of uh, their money held on deposit with SVB UK. Those deposits 
are now safe. That breaking news in the last few minutes, HSBC UK has bought Silicon Valley Bank UK. Ian, thanks a lot. Well, he mentioned Mark Kleiman there, uh, who broke this news just a short while ago. Let's talk to him now. Uh, Mark, what is behind this deal? How has it come about? Uh, po apologies, we can't bring you Mark at the moment. Uh, just to see if you can hear us, Mark. Nope. We can't bring him, but we will bring him to you later in the programme and he will give us all the nuts and bolts of actually uh, what, how this deal came about. But let's move on now. And the row between Gary Lineker and the BBC could potentially be resolved as soon as today. Sky News understands that there could be a statement as early as this morning following a weekend of disruption to the BBC's football shows. Lineker did not appear on Match of the Day over the weekend. He was told to stand down from the role after he tweeted comparing language used to launch a new government asylum policy with 1930s Germany. Well, the BBC was forced to axe much of its weekend's football coverage as a number of presenters announced that they would not appear in solidarity with Lineker. Meanwhile, the light row left the BBC's chair, Richard Sharp, fighting for his future after Rishi Sunak declined to offer him his backing. Mr Sharp was dragged into the controversy because of his close ties to government and the role he played when Boris Johnson was considering taking a huge loan when he was Prime Minister. The circumstances of his appointment are being reviewed. Richard Sharp was appointed by government before my time, before I was Prime Minister. With regard to his appointment, it's right that that's done independently and rigorously. That process happened before I was Prime Minister, it had nothing to do with me, uh, and at the time was conducted with all the way that it should have been. Now, that, uh, that process is being reviewed, but the Independent Appointments Commissioner has appointed a leading uh, barrister, I believe, to review that process. Right that we let that continue. Well, our political correspondent Tamara Cohen is here. And, and Tamara, a, a political tweet that's had ramifications for sport. Now it's coming back to politics again. Absolutely. Um, Sky News is uh, understanding that there could be a statement as soon as this morning from the BBC. And we reported uh, last night that there's increasing confidence around those close to Gary Lineker that it will be resolved to satisfaction today. So we wait to see what happens in the coming hours. But it will be regarded uh, by many in the Conservative Party, who, of course, um, were furious about uh, this tweet when it came out last week as a climb down by the director general Tim Davey because of course Gary Lineker has not apologized and has a great has had a great deal of support uh, for standing up uh, for what he believes in so there's going to be an outcry from some conservatives uh, if he is reinstated to present match of the day again next weekend which is what we expect will happen but of course on the other side of the spectrum we've had labor and the liberal democrats uh, saying that it's been uh, the bbc that has mishandled this and given in they say to government pressure so i'm sure we'll see more clashes along those lines today as of course the real issues here this illegal migration bill that the government is bringing forward is going to have its uh, first uh, debate in Parliament today. It's called a second reading. There may well be a vote on it later today. And I think we're already starting to see, as well as um, stinging criticism from opposition parties, some conservative jitters about some of the content of the bill and whether it's actually going to really work in uh, allowing people to be removed within 28 days, which is what the government says it will do. OK, so you'll bring us latest on that and, and anything that we hear about Gary Lineker. Thanks a lot, Tamara. Well, also today, junior doctors in England will walk out the start of a three-day strike in the ongoing dispute over pay. The British Medical Association says that they have no option but to strike, while the government has called the decision disappointing. Well, let's take you through the numbers. Over 36,000 junior doctors who are members of the BMA voted in favour of strike action. That is 98% of the members who were balloted. The strike action will last 72 hours. It will begin this morning and end on Thursday morning. During this time, BMA doctors will not attend any shifts. Well, the BMA says junior doctors have had their pay cut by more than a quarter since 2008 and they want a full pay restoration, amounting to an increase of around 35%, which the government has called unaffordable. NHS England says the action is expected to see some of the most severe disruption of health services to date. They say emergency and critical care will still be prioritised. Appointments will only be cancelled where it's unavoidable and patients will be offered alternative dates as soon as possible. Well, our correspondent Shaman Freeman-Powell joins me now. Uh, Shaman, this is considerable disruption over a considerable period of time, isn't it? Um, what are they saying about the, the impact this is going to have on patients? 
Well, NHS leaders are worried that this uh, particular strike action today will be the first day of a 72-hour walkout. Will likely have a significant impact, bigger than the impact that we've seen over recent weeks and months with some other NHS uh, workforce taking strike action as well. Today has been dubbed the biggest uh, walkout by doctors in the NHS's history. And today, tens of thousands of doctors across the country will be taking strike action. Now, as you just said, it's over pay and it's over working conditions. Junior doctors, which, uh, which basically means anyone that's uh, newly qualified up until those that have years of experience, they're asking for a 35% increase. They say, though, it's not a pay rise. It's simply rectifying the fact that they have seen real-term cuts of around 26% since 2008. So they're calling for more money and for better working conditions as well as they say that in the long run it will help patients. However, the government says that this is unaffordable and they've said that they are very disappointed that the uh, BMA have opted to take strike action rather than sitting around the negotiating table like some of the uh, other NHS unions have done. However, the BMA points out that in other parts of the country, so in, in Wales and in Scotland, that strike action has been uh, paused and that it's the Westminster government that are refusing to actually negotiate this. But as we already know, there are huge waiting lists already for people trying to get uh, treatment at the, on the NHS. It's a waiting list of around 7 million people waiting for procedures. And so the NHS leaders are worried that this 72-hour strike action will only make that worse. OK, Shaman, thanks very much. We're going to be talking to a representative from Junior Doctors a little later in the programme. Uh, but let's remind you of the breaking news this morning. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has confirmed that the government and the Bank of England have helped facilitate a private sale of the UK arm of the failed lender Silicon Valley Bank to HSBC. The move will protect deposits without taxpayer support. In a statement, the Chancellor said the UK's tech sector is generally genuinely world leading and of huge importance to the British economy, supporting hundreds of thousands of jobs. I said yesterday we would look after our tech sector and we have worked urgently to deliver on that promise and find a solution that will provide SVB's UK customers with confidence. It's budget week, so don't forget that as well. Now, Rishi Sunak has pledged to increase the UK's defence spending by nearly £5 billion over the next two years to counter emerging threats from hostile states. The Prime Minister made the announcement during his trip to California, where he's meeting his US and Australian counterparts to discuss the expansion of nuclear-powered submarines under what's known as the AUKUS Pact. Our Deputy Political Editor Sam Coates has been travelling with the Prime Minister and sent this report. Travelling over 5,000 miles, a Prime Minister trying to get attention. At home, his government announcing a refresh of foreign and security policy, costing £5 billion. But he's abroad, going to San Diego on the US West Coast to explain why he's spending more on defence. He's just one of the world leaders here in California boasting about military might because of threats not just from Russia, but China too. It's clear that the world has become more volatile, the threats to our security have increased, and that's why we're investing £5 billion more in our well-beating armed forces over the next two years and increasing our defence spending to 2.5% of GDP so we can continue to be a world leader when it comes to defence and keep our country safe. A massive and controversial deal set out today to build and sell nuclear-powered submarines to the Australians, helping an ally in the Pacific dealing with China on their doorstep. Leaders wait years for the kind of photo opportunity which Rishi Sunak will experience later today, standing shoulder to shoulder next to the US president, talking about their importance on the world stage. But there's no quick fix to global security. This is a poker game between superpowers. A British Prime Minister with his Australian counterpart, Anthony Albanese, showing the depth of friendship between the two countries, an alliance both men want China to notice. It's an important day for UK-Australia relations with the announcement that we're making.
a long planned meeting about military security abroad. But the PM found himself trying to shore up economic security at home as well. A bank collapse meant multiple virtual meetings with his Chancellor. A PM finding plans change when a real crisis hits. Sam Coates, Sky News, San Diego. Well, our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, joins me now. Uh, and Deborah, we're expecting this sort of tweak to the defence budget. Tell us a little bit more. So the Prime Minister is announcing this extra £5 billion. Pounds. It's nearly, it's about £50 million pounds short, to be honest. Um, but most of it is actually going into the nuclear deterrent, which means, in reality, for the conventional forces, there's only going to be an extra £1.9 billion pounds over the next two years. And the army alone has, uh, I, I understand, um, needs around £3 billion not to avoid cuts. Uh, and so, while, well, yes, of course, any new money is welcome, this is not not enough and this commitment to increase the defence budget spending to 2.5% of GDP has no time frame. So unless it has a time frame that's meaningful, the MOD planners can't really use that to rely on for long term planning. Uh, and what about the Im impact of China? We're, we're hearing about that's obviously going to be a, a big subject that they're discussing there at that, that meeting um, with Albanese. Uh, but is the, is the UK government going to change its language? Yeah, well, this um, integrated review refresh, it's a refresh of a policy document that was published two years ago. Uh, it does seem as though it's going to have a bit stronger language on China. Previously, it described China as a systemic challenge. And now the language is talking about an epoch-defining challenge. It will reaffirm this idea that China poses the longest term um, state-based threat to UK economic security. But it's not going as far as all out saying China is the kind of state threat that the UK regards Russia as being, which is still the fundamental top priority. OK, Deborah, thanks very much. Well, as Western leaders meet to finalise these defence pacts, as we've been saying, China's President Xi Jinping uh, is also being discussed and he's given his final speech to the country's annual parliamentary meeting known as the National People's Congress. The president used part of his address to focus on the country's military, which he says needs to be converted into a great wall of steel. Our Asia correspondent, Helena Ann Smith, has more from Beijing. This is the Great Ceremony Hall within the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. This is China's equivalent of Parliament. It is the place where this country holds its moments of grandest theatre. And today has been no exception. What we've seen here today is the closing ceremony of what's called the MPC, the National People's Congress. Theoretically, this meeting is about setting legislation and potentially even changing the constitution in practice. A lot of things have been decided behind closed doors. And the session finished with a speech from the president, President Xi Jinping. Ping. The strongest applause uh, from the delegates came when he spoke about Taiwan. He reiterated uh, the desire to reunify, uh, as he calls it, the country of China, that China has a right uh, to do that, and that was met uh, with applause. Notably, though, he, he didn't repeat language we've heard from him in the past where he says that China reserves the right to take any means necessary to reunify Taiwan. Um, that wasn't repeated, which is actually interesting. It's sort of less slightly less chest thumping than we sometimes hear. But he did say that China needed to um, convert its military into what it called a great wall of steel, which is a really interesting message uh, for the West. In a week, there has been a lot of tough rhetoric about that increasingly tense standoff with America. And it comes, interestingly, today on the very day that Rishi Sunak is in America meeting with Joe Biden and the Prime Minister of Australia to discuss that ACOS uh, defence pact. That is a pact that China finds very provocative. It sees it as the West trying to expand its influence in this region. So that message will not have gone unheeded. Helen Ann Smith there. Now, a night to remember that went without a hitch. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Well, it won everything, everywhere, all at once. It dominated this year's Oscars, winning seven awards out of all of its nominations. Well, Sky's Katie Spencer joins us now from the Vanity Fair after-party red carpet event. Katie, I feel enormously underdressed. You look absolutely amazing. You're blending right in. Uh, <laughs> what has been the reaction to the, to the evening and, and the awards and how have they gone down? Look, this is always an exciting event because you get the stars turning up with their awards. You get to ha handle a little gold statuette, as I have uh, just a moment ago. James Friend, who was one of the few British winners tonight who won for cinematography, he's just uh, gone inside now. But look, it, it wasn't too good a night for, for British successes. 
but it was a night of tears, a night of thanking the mums and a, a night of stars breaking into song, as Martha Kellner reports now. And the Oscar goes to everything, everywhere, all at once. 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 A film which takes place in the multiverse and on the big night one in almost every dimension. A story about bagels, tax audits and hot dog hands. But at its heart, a celebration of an immigrant family recognised with a record number of awards for an Asian-led cast. For all the little boys and girls who look like me watching tonight, <laughs> this is a beacon of hope and possibilities. Michelle Yeoh made her on-screen debut 37 years ago, and this was her first Oscar nomination and win. Her on-screen husband, Kei Hui Kwan, returned from a two-decade break from acting and took the Best Supporting Actor award. My journey started on a boat. I spent a year in a refugee camp, and somehow I ended up here on Hollywood's biggest stage. This, this is the American dream. From one winner who fled the Vietnam War as a child, two minutes later... Jamie Lee Curtis! A first Oscar for his co-star, who grew up in Tinseltown and became Hollywood royalty. In the tightly contested Best Actor category, Brendan Fraser beat Irishmen Colin Farrell and Paul Mescal to the punch for his portrayal of an obese man in The Whale. He then paid tribute to his fellow nominees. You laid your whale-sized hearts bare, and it is my honour to be named alongside you in this category. After Will Smith's slap on last year's host Chris Rock, the Academy parachuted in a safe pair of hands in Jimmy Kimmel. And in his opening monologue, multiple nods to that show-stealing moment. If anyone in this theatre commits an act of violence at any point during the show, you will be awarded the Oscar for Best Actor. <laughs> But this wasn't a controversy-free zone. There was mention of this year's outrage about a lack of recognition for female directors. How does the Academy not nominate the guy who directed Avatar? What do they think he is, a woman? <laughs> the Academy will be pleased broadcasting resumed as normal this year, with no major hiccups. But it was this victory for Asian cast and crew that set these awards apart. Martha Kellner, Sky News, Hollywood. Well, look, you might not be able to see, but you can certainly see the big crowd over here of people filming on their phones as Michelle Yeoh uh, has just walked into the Vanity Fair party. She is, of course, the woman of the hour in that speech. She talk about, talked about dreams coming true, about this being history in the making, the first British Asian actress to win that leading actress uh, award. And what a night for her. We, we saw her in tears on the stage there thanking her, her mum and talking about the fact that she is an older actress as well and what it's meant to her to, to be an older actress and, and receiving that award. Look, this is what happens at the Vanity Fair party. They all come past us tonight. They all go and now want to let their hair down. It is an incredible achievement, particularly for Michelle Yeoh. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible film and an incredible starring role that she makes in Everything Everywhere. What a night. Now, no doubt, she'll be going inside to celebrate. Who would blame her? Oh, <laughs> indeed. Katie, thanks so much. Some interesting fashions. Interesting and inverted commas behind Katie there. Um, now, to story here. And junior doctors in England will walk out today as part of a three-day strike in the ongoing dispute over pay. Joining me now, the chief executive of Leeds Teaching Hospitals, NHS Trust, Sir Julian Hartley. Uh, very good to speak to you today, Sir Julian Hartley. Um, how damaging do you think this strike is going to be to NHS services today? Well, good morning. And just to, uh, just to say, I am chief executive of NHS providers. I was the chief executive of Leeds Teaching Hospitals, so I know well just how um, significant this situation is. And in terms of how damaging it will be, well, obviously, it's a major event in terms of around... Uh, 60,000 doctors making up almost half of the medical workforce, those junior doctors walking out. Uh, that will mean that 
um, their work will need to be covered by largely consultants, associate specialists, staff grades and, and other staff, which in turn means significant disruption to patients who are waiting for operations, appointments, outpatient services and so on. And of course, the NHS is prioritising urgent and emergency care, critical care, intensive care, maternity, cancer surgery. That means, obviously, that many services will face disruption and patients, consequently, will have to wait longer for treatment. Now, the NHS will do its best to catch up, but it's fair to say there will be significant disruption as a consequence of this 72-hour strike. In which areas do you think that is going to be worst hit? Which areas of medicine do you think are going to really feel the strain? Well, I think particularly in terms of those patients waiting for elective planned treatment and indeed outpatient appointments and also, um, you know, other, other, other areas will be affected because, of course, it's not just hospitals, it's uh, mental health services, community services as well. I think the key thing, though, here is we're at a point where the NHS is driving towards reducing that backlog of patients uh, needing operations aiming to achieve um, no one waiting longer than 78 weeks by April, that is obviously under threat given the scale of this action and the fact that already as a consequence of industrial action generally in the NHS, we've seen around 140,000 uh, procedures, appointments and so on um, disrupted as a consequence of action. So I'm sure over the next three days we'll see many more which will add to the challenge of delivering against the reduction of uh, waiting times for patients, which is such an important priority for the NHS right now. And those cancelled and rescheduled appointments that people may have had to wait a really long time for, and, and then having them cancelled at the last minute, it, it's quite cruel, isn't it? What would you well, say to I mean, these people affected? Well, I mean, I, th I think the, you know, I know the NHS uh, would want to apologise to those patients and, and obviously is working incredibly hard to reschedule and manage those accordingly. I think it's important to say that patients should still attend unless they've heard uh, from uh, the, uh, the the NHS Trust uh, concerned. And of course, um, GPs uh, are available. Uh, patients should still access healthcare as usual, call 999 in an emergency. But for non-urgent cases, obviously, GPs are available and indeed consider using the 111 service. But the impact on patients is significant and we can't underestimate that, which is why we want to see a resolution to this action. And in the same way that other health unions are in negotiations with government. We want to see exactly the same take place for junior doctors. I've worked with many fantastic junior doctors over the course of my career. There are, there are an incredible group of colleagues. We want to see uh, a fair settlement for our junior doctors. And indeed, for the NHS more widely, we want to see and make sure that the Chancellor backs a long-term workforce plan for the NHS in the forthcoming budget to address the workforce shortages, the challenges, the training, the development, the recruitment, the retention, everything we need in the NHS for our workforce to make sure that we're fit for the future. What would your message be, though, to the junior doctors? Some are saying that their idea of a 36% pay rise is entirely unrealistic and, and that they aren't willing also to negotiate with the Department of Health. They've been offered talks and they don't appear to be taking up the Health Secretary on those talks. Well, we, we want to see both parties come together, obviously, and we want to see, we want to make sure that, um, you know, the spirit of collaboration is there. We want to make sure that as employers, you know, as as I represent uh, NHS trusts uh, as the as the, you know, the employers of um, of all of the key NHS staff. But those negotiations between junior doctors and the government take place at a national level. So we want to see dialogue. We want to see that happen quickly. We want to make sure there's a, obviously a, a fair settlement. And it's only when you start those negotiations and start talking that you can really get into the art of the possible and finding a solution. Uh, and hopefully one that uh, ensures that we've got a positive and um, engaged, empowered, motivated group of junior doctor colleagues moving forward because, of course, the challenges that they face, that indeed the NHS staff generally have faced, have been enormous over the last few years. And, of course, pay has not kept up with inflation and the cost of living. And we want to make sure that NHS staff are appropriately rewarded and remunerated, given the incredible jobs that they all do. Uh, and briefly, uh, Sir Julian Hartley, do, do you think people should call 999 if they need to? And, and can you guarantee that if they do call 999, 
and are rushed to hospital, there'll be a doctor there to treat them. People absolutely should call 999 in an emergency and the NHS is prioritising exactly those services, critical care, urgent and emergency care, um, maternity, cancer surgery and so on. It's prioritising the, the most urgent um, and vital healthcare services and so patients should absolutely do that in confidence. The NHS is still there for them, um, but uh, I would say for non-urgent cases, GP services are available, NHS 11 is available and um, patients should make the right choices in, in that respect. OK, so Julian Hartley, Chief Executive, NHS Providers, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let's take a look at the Monday morning front pages and BBC executives are scrambling to repair relations with a former England captain, according to The Guardian, to prevent a staff mutiny at the corporation. The Telegraph says the BBC will climb down and allow Gary Lineker to return as Match of the Day host next Saturday. In The Times, BBC bosses seek a truce to get Lineker back on side. Away from the Lineker and BBC Row, the Daily Express reports that the Home Secretary, Suala Braverman, has told police forces they must focus on solving crime rather than investigating woke complaints. Time for the weather. Now, the UK's three largest conservation charities, the National Trust, the RSPB and WWF, have joined forces to campaign to arrest the decline in UK nature. The charities campaign aims to show people how important nature is and what we can do to save it. Research suggests that more than three quarters of Britons are worried about the decline in nature, but the charities say there is only just enough of the UK's natural world left to save and that doing so will require leaders, the public and businesses to all work together. We'll talk about that a little more a little later ahead but still to come we will also look at some of the best dressed on last night's champagne carpet at the oscars is it champagne is it beige you let me know what you think Now, it may have been a champagne-coloured carpet, but that certainly didn't stop celebrities' red carpet looks at last night's Oscars. Let's take a look at some of them. Uh, Rihanna, whose song Lift Me Up was nominated for an award, showed off her baby bump in this amazing leather and silk creation. And Michelle Yeoh, who made history as the first Asian woman to win Best Actress, stunned in this incredible, elegant Dior gown. Dwayne The Rock Johnson stood out in the crowd of black and white tuxedos, instead opting for a ballet pink Dolce & Gabbana suit jacket. Fetching. And Malala Yousafzai, whose film Stranger at the Gate was nominated for Best Documentary Short Film, was certainly shining bright in this sequined Ralph Lauren gown. Really beautiful. Who's your winner? Let us know. Meanwhile, the ballot for SNP members to vote to choose their winner, their next leader, opens today with Ash Reagan, Hamza Yousaf and Kate Forbes all fighting it out. The contest has been more than just a political fight as personal attacks have mixed with criticism of the candidates' records, rocking a decade of unity in the party. Sky's Scotland correspondent Conor Gillis reports. This race has been far from fun and games for a party in pursuit well, of... An SNP consultant, Pat Kane, and the Scottish political editor of the Press Association of Scotland, Katrine Bussey, who both join me now. Uh, great to see you both. Uh, Pat, to you first of all. Tonight, Sky viewers are going to be able to watch this SNP leadership debate hosted by Beth Rigby. What do you hope the potential leaders focus on? I think you're probably best described as SNP friendly irritant rather than SNP consultant, but we'll, we'll proceed from there. Um, I think what's, there's been obviously quite a lot of um, classic politics and, and classic character assassination, which you would expect in any one of these kind of debates. It's not all going to be platonic hand-holding dialogue. Um, I think there's a convergence around, funny enough, between the candidates around economics. There was a, there was a debate that we had with a thing called Believe in Scotland, which is a business, pro-independence business organisation the other night. And all three of them, I couldn't put a, a cigarette paper between them as they are talking about the well-being economy. Um, and I think it's quite interesting if you're... Uh, the great challenge for them coming up for the case for independence is the rise of the Labour Party. And uh, But there's two aspects to that, one of which is the Labour Party are stealing quite a lot of independence policies, things like the National Investment Bank and, and, and Green, uh, Green New Deal. 
But on the other side, as Rachel Reeves was saying this morning, she thinks the, the, the SNP are paying too many taxes. So that will allow independents to say when it, when it comes up to a plebiscite, these are just watered down Tories, the Labour Party. You don't want to vote for them. If you want to be back in Europe, you want to be reconnected, get out of Brexit and be reconnected with the EU and, and on a whole other set of fronts that they will be able to say that the Labour Party is on the right of centre or soft centre, right? Uh, that will be the, one of the edge cases that I think will be made uh, for saying that independence is um, urgent rather than something that takes five, six, seven years to bring about. OK, uh, so the economy and the rise of the Labour Party for you. Katrine, um, what do you think? I mean, it seems a lot of the, the focus has been on, on trans rights over the last few months. Has the party now moved on from that? I don't think it has, to be honest. The SNP, as well as these televised leadership debates we've been seeing, the SNP have been running a series of hustings events for, for party members. There's been, I think, eight or nine of them so far. I've watched a few of them um, and the issue of the gender recognition reform bill has come up at most of them. And it is an issue on, on which the party and indeed the, the candidates are massively divided. So it is a moment when the SNP going forward has to pick a side. It has to, to come down and, and decide which side of the fence it is on on this really controversial issue. Mm. Pat, Pat, you've already uh, nailed your colours to the mast. I understand that you, you're back, backing Hamza. Um, why do you think he is the right candidate to lead the SNP forwards right now? Uh, because I think that there are a number, as I say, there are a number of big uh, plebiscitary democratic tests that are coming along. And I think continuity with what the SNP has done in the past is going to be essential in terms of handling those. You know, for example, we don't know whether the, the Labour majority is going to persist. There might be a progressive majority in which the SNP play a key part. So I think there has to be a sense in which uh, the, the leader can carry the, the case of independence, but can also deal with the situations that are coming up and unavoidable unavoidably coming up. I mean, the, the great element of the SNP is that it supplanted the Labour Party in the affections of the Scottish people. A resurgent Labour Party is always a challenge to that theory of the SNP, how the SNP is successful. So I think a, a continuity candidate um, with a certain amount of energy to redefine the independence case is a good idea. Uh, Ash is not up to, up to scratch, in my opinion, and Kate Forbes is, is fatally flawed by her statements about uh, acting on her refree principles when it comes to gay marriage and that she would have voted against that. I don't think, I think that's a host, such a hostage to fortune. She'll be constantly attacked on the moral case from day one of uh, of her uh, leadership. You know, are you according with your own moral principles by being a liberal modern person? The answer is quite difficult for her. Mm. Uh uh, Catherine, uh, Hamza Yusuf also has big support in the Deputy First Minister, uh, the Deputy Leader of the SNP in Westminster. In, in your mind, is he the clear favourite? Is he the one to beat? I think it's actually it's really interesting because for the first time in Scotland in a long time, we're having an election where we don't know who the winner is going to be. And that says something about the electoral dominance the SNP have enjoyed in Scotland over the last 15 or so years. But I think it also says... Um, that there's been something of a lack of succession planning within the party for when Nicola Sturgeon has stepped down. And as you, as Pat said, there, there are real differences between the candidates on not perhaps so much economic issues, although I think some of those are there. There are ish diff differences on, on the social issues. Um, so I think there is a real choice for for members who are the people who will make this decision. Hamza Yusuf, yes, is very much the preferred candidate of the SNP establishment. And we're seeing that with the likes of John Swinney and, and the Westminster leadership team, both Mary Black and Stephen Flynn, Flynn the new Westminster leader of the SNP, have come out and, and backed Hamza Yusuf. But Kate Forbes is the person who's, who's polling better, although, again, that's not necessarily reliable because polls are done either of the general public or indeed perhaps of people who voted SNP in the most recent elections, it's SNP members, not just SNP voters, but only SNP members who, who will be the ones who make this decision over the next two weeks. Mm. Pat, I mean, I mean, yes, we've talked a lot about Kate Forbes' strong religious views, but Hamza Youssef is also uh, a, a religious man. Does he not have questions to answer about votes that he may have avoided attending in the past? 
I think he has a good record on uh, liberal voting uh, on all manners of issues, including including gender issues. Um, I think he's made a clear uh, distinction between his um, ethics and morality and his his um, responsibility to the general consensus of the Scottish public and of his party. Um, I think Kate started off with, um, I mean, what, what, what do you say? Oh, uh, politicians are, are too candid about what motivates them sometimes. That would, be, that would be something we wouldn't necessarily ask for. But I think she was. And I think that there's a real fear that a kind of independence which was moved away from in the Salmon and then the Sturgeon era, which is the idea this isn't an ethnic case, this is a civic case, this is a progressive case, this is a utilitarian case for independence. I mean, I know Kate is extremely, um, has, has great chops in terms of her economics, you know, she's Oxford graduate and business graduate and so forth. But I, I think I think this isn't a modern Scotland that is being appealed to here. This is a Scotland that people thought we had been loosened from the grip of uh, and, and we're at least able to have a, have a kind of plural liberal discussions. I, th I mean, Yusuf, I think, has demonstrated he's capable of doing that. I think there are doubts about whether Kate Forbes is. Uh, finally, Catherine, what about Ash Regan? I mean, what does she have to do to cut through with voters, do you think? Ash Regan's very much the outsider in this contest. I think she will appeal to a certain element within the party. You know, she's she's talked about how she's the outsider, so she's working harder to get her, her point of view across. But I think for most people, she'll be known as being the one person who's quit the SNP while in the, they're in government on a point of principle. And I think, you know, she quit the SNP government to, to vote against the gender recognition reforms. And I think that will very much be her core support um, and say, I think, she is very much the rank outsider. It's going to be a fascinating uh, leadership campaign. Thank you both so much for joining us, Pat Kane and Catherine Bussey. Thank you. And just to let you know that tonight we will have that special debate on the race to become Scotland's first minister. Our political editor, Beth Rigby, will be joined by the three candidates, Kate Forbes, Hamza Youssef and Ash Regan. That is tonight at seven o'clock. Tune in for that. Now, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has been speaking in the last few minutes about the sale of the UK arm of the collapsed US lender Silicon Valley Bank. Let's take a listen. Well, there was never a systemic risk to our financial stability in the UK. The Bank of England governor made that clear from the outset. But a number of our most promising and important technology and life science companies had their money with Silicon Valley Bank in their UK branch. So we've been working over the weekend. I've been in constant contact with the Governor of the Bank of England, uh, the Prudential Regulatory Authority, uh, the Prime Minister, to work up a solution. Uh, we do now have that solution. A sale has been agreed to HSBC, which is Europe's biggest bank, one of the most creditworthy institutions in the world. And what that means is that all those really important companies that had deposits with Silicon Valley Bank UK can access their deposits, uh, can access normal banking services as of this morning. It's a very important outcome. No taxpayers' money has been used, and I think it's a result of a lot of hard work. But I also think it shows that the UK has uh, great resilience in its financial system, that we're able to step in with one of our biggest UK banks in a situation like this and protect a very important sector. It has been a weekend of frenzied activity. We know that. Why was it so important to get this done quickly? Well, when you have very young companies, very promising companies, uh, they're also fragile. Uh, they need to pay their staff. And they were worried that as of 8 o'clock this morning, uh, they might literally not be able to access their bank accounts. Some of them only had bank accounts with Silicon Valley Bank UK. And so for that reason, we were faced with a situation where uh, we could have seen some of our most important companies, our most strategic companies, uh, wiped out. And that would have been extremely dangerous. We have built, over the last decade, the third largest tech economy in the world, after only China and the United States. So it's very important to us, as a country, that this sector thrives. And that's why the Prime Minister, I, the Bank of England, were all rolling our sleeves up over the weekend to make sure we had a solution. OK, but this whole crisis emerged from something completely unexpected, the collapse of a US bank because of unforeseen circumstances, unforeseen weaknesses in the financial system. How concerned are you that there might be other similar situations brewing up inside the financial system? 
Well, we always have to watch everything that's happening everywhere in the world when it comes to financial stability. But what I would say is the Bank of England is very clear. The UK banking system is extremely uh, secure. It's well capitalised. And I think we demonstrated that uh, resilience by what was happening over the weekend and the fact that we were able to come up with a solution so quickly. And final question, why did you push for a sale? But there, are, there were other options on the table. Well, we uh, were keen to make sure there was a solution that protected our tech sector, protected these companies. Uh, we were neutral as to what that solution was, except for the fact, obviously, we did not want taxpayers' money to be used. Um, but we were looking at all options, uh, and we needed to be sure that if the sale didn't happen, we had other solutions ready. Uh, that's why it was important to do a huge amount of work on a variety of solutions over the weekend. Well, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, there explained the government's rationale between getting involved uh, in the collapse of SVB Bank and what they've done over the last few hours. We're back now to one of our other top stories. The row between Gary Lineker and the BBC could look like it could be resolved as soon as today. Joining me now, former chief executive of Channel 5 and a former BBC producer, David Elstein. Uh, David, uh, good to talk to you today. Uh, it does look like reading the runes that the talks are happening, that there could be a resolution, but... In all, how do you think this round has been handled by the BBC? Well, um, when the BBC says things are going in the right direction, uh, you do have to ask yourself, what is that direction? Is it retreat or is it route? Um, clearly, uh, the BBC has been uh, taken aback by uh, the way that uh, Gary Lineker has been supported by uh, his fellow uh, footballing uh, community, pundits, commentators, etc., uh, some of whom don't even believe he's uh, breached the BBC's editorial guidelines, which is, is clearly not the case. And the way it's being resolved, as far as we can see, is that the BBC will agree to revisit those guidelines, and maybe Gary will say either sorry or I'll be more careful in future, or maybe he won't. Uh, he's not shown much inclination to do so until now. And what, what is your feeling? Do you, do you think he has broken the guidelines? Well, of course he has. Um, you just have to read the guidelines saying that people who are prominent presenters of BBC programmes need to be careful about what they say in, in terms of party political issues. Um, he doesn't think that should apply to him. Quite a lot of other people agree with him, but I suspect a majority of the public might agree with him. Uh, but the BBC has this problem, which is it's a unitary organisation. All its programming is meant to observe the rules of due impartiality, as it's called in the legislation. Uh, most importantly, news and current affairs. But the difficulty is what latitude does that give uh, other bits of the BBC, entertainment parts of the BBC, sport, comedy, uh, whatever it might be, if their freelance contributors happen to have strong political views. And I'm sure Tim Davy, the Director General, thought he had sorted it out with his new guidelines, but clearly he hasn't. Do you think the BBC is being even-handed, though? Because, of course, other tweets have been brought up, and Alan Sugar tweeted just three months ago quite a political tweet about Mick Lynch. Um, he, of course, is also a presenter for the BBC on an entertainment programme, admittedly. But do you think the BBC is, is treating everybody the same? No, of course not, because there are shades of grey here. Uh, I mean, Chris Backham, uh, who does a lot of um, country life presentation for the BBC, is a passionate uh, advocate of certain things uh, on that agenda. Um, Alan Sugar is a, a much more irregular um, presenter uh, on the BBC than Gary Lineker. Gary Lineker uh, does 50, 60 programmes a year, sports personality of the air, uh, match of the day all the way round, lots of live presenting, he's done Olympics. Uh, he's done it for 25 years. Pretty so big show, though, is isn't it? More, he is much more visible. So, look, uh, clearly there are shades of grey, but the BBC struggles to grasp in one set of guidelines all the different possible variations that might be. And as a previous Director General, Mark Thompson, said over the weekend, it's struggling with the 21st century and the age of social media. 
Uh, it, it hasn't got it right yet, and whether it will get it right uh, soon, who can say? Uh, the first urgent priority is to get Gary back in the studio on Saturday, if not for match of the day, then for the live FA Cup coverage, um, and try and treat this retreat as tactical rather than strategic. But it's been a pretty bad weekend for the BBC. And very briefly, David, we've only got 30 seconds left. Um, we've heard comments from the Prime Minister appearing to distance himself from the BBC chairman, Richard Sharp. Do you think he should remain in his job? Well, it, it, it's a kind of slightly different issue because what Richard Sharp did wrong was fail to declare uh, in his application form for the BBC chairmanship all his relationships with uh, Boris Johnson. Uh, he, he was in my view, wrong not to make that declaration. Whether uh, the inquiry that's currently going on says on that basis he should now pull up, you know, resign, is another matter. But it's been another awkward embarrassment for the BBC because the chairman's been invisible all weekend because he's under pressure, uh, and that's been no help to his director general. David Elstein, former head of Channel 5, we're going to leave it there. Great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure, Kevin. Lots more to come on that story and all the rest of the day's news after this short break.